Hey, welcome back to Movies and More. I'm Philip. We're about to dive into a Q&A with James Cameron and John Landau, the producers behind what will be the mega hit, Avatar The Way of Water. Um, directed, written, and produced by James Cameron. He's participating virtually because he is sick at home with COVID. So let's take a look. Don't forget to like and subscribe so you don't miss any of these in the future. Enjoy. Hey, I'm fine, guys, and, and it's, uh, thank you. And uh, it's great to uh, be here, even even virtually. Uh, sorry I can't be there in person. Excellent. So I want to start off with, you know, the one, these movies are made very differently from other films, other, other big budget VFX films that we see. Let's start off really quickly with the writer's room and the whole idea of bringing the writers together for two years, I believe it was about two years. You had to have all the scripts written before you get, and, and then the actors had to read everything before, before you went into production. Could you tell us more about that bringing? In no. No. Uh, so yeah, I think if you included all drafts and sets, it might have been about a year and a half. It was about a, it was a six month intensive period where I had the other four writers with me uh, in a writing room, which I enjoyed from my TV production days way back. Uh, you know, a decade earlier on Dark Angel. I just enjoyed the principle of that. I thought, all right, if we're going to do multiple scripts, why not do it sort of TV style um, and uh, form multiple teams? So we sat, um, we sat in a room for six months. We broke story across the whiteboards, uh, across three films, which ultimately, because they were a little too jam-packed, we redistributed into four films eventually. And the, the fun thing about that was I refused to tell them, no matter how much they asked, which actual script they would be writing after we, after we went through breaking story across the entire saga or the entire story arc. And the reason was because I knew that the second I told them which one they were going to be on, they'd completely lose interest in any discussions about the other two, the other two movies. So everybody was invested every day, like it was all there. And I think that made a huge difference. Uh, and then on the very last day, right before Christmas of, of uh, 2013, I said, all right, you're going to do this one, you're going to do this one, you're going to do that one. And then they promptly lost interest in the further discussions <laughs> in that day uh, whenever we turned our attention to a different script that they weren't going to be working on. So I was 100% right. We all had a good laugh about it. And then everybody went off to their various corners to, to do their draft. And then it was just an iterative process um, after that. Yeah, but Jim, at the, even before we started the writer's room, Jim had created 1,500 pages of detailed story notes. And we brought the writers in, and they were all excited with, with you know, to give us their ideas. And, and we said to them, hey, before you say anything, we want you to watch the first movie again. We want you to look at material that was written about the first movie. Because we all want to understand why did the first movie work and then we could start breaking down Jim's 1,500 pages of notes, and then we could hear your ideas. And then, yeah, it wasn't an exercise in blowing smoke up our own skirts. It was really, if we can't figure out how the first film connected with people across all cultures and languages around the world, then we're not prepared to write the second one. So we really had to drill, drill down, and you know, we figured, okay, there's the obvious stuff. And then there's the thematic stuff. And then ultimately, we realize that there might be a deeper level even than that, which I call the tertiary level, which is more about the subconscious, more about feeling, more about feeling like you're in a dream state, like, a, like a, a, an open-eyed, awaking dream state. And what does it take to, to recreate that? And, and what are the maybe you know, kind of spiritual and subconscious uh, connections? What are the kind of Jungian archetypes, things like that? So we spent a fair bit of time on that before we launched on the new story. And ultimately our story, each of our three stories had to, you know, kind of come up to that level, at least in our ability to anticipate that. What was the ripple effect when you decided we, you needed an extra sequel? It was, uh, it was met with a lot of consternation. 
at Fox, which I didn't quite understand. I said, guys, how about extra opportunity to make two million, two billion bucks? They didn't see it the way I saw it. Um, but it turned out to be the right answer. The film you just saw was part of that first script, which never quite worked. And, and our biggest struggle was in the first act. Uh, the first act was just too jam-packed, dealing with the first, reiterating the first movie, dealing with the 15 years in between the first story and the second story, then launching a new conflict and introducing a bunch of new characters. It just never worked until finally I took a big chunk, sort of ripped it bleeding out of act one and stuck it into act one of, of move, what will be movie three. Uh, and then it all, it all fell into place. It all fell into place after that. And once I think the, the folks at, at Fox uh, read the actual scripts, they saw how it would work and they, they embraced it and greenlit the project across a four film arc, which I think is a pretty bold play and they, they deserve credit for that. Now, even before the writer's room came together, the art design was going on? Concurrently. So concurrently, we, we hired our, our production designers at the same time that Jim and the writer's room started working together. And it was this really valuable process where Jim would bring down the writers to the art department, let them see what they were working at. And the art, and the art department would get excited when later when they would see pages that were inspired by concept art that they had driven. Jim, what do you say it was a great back and forth process that they had? It was a really fertile feedback loop. And I wanted, you know, the, typically your designers and your creature artists and that sort of thing don't really ever deal with, the, with the, the writing process. But I thought it's all storytelling. It's visual storytelling, it's written storytelling, it's told in words, it's told in pictures. Let's get everybody on the, on the same sheet music. And so often we take ideas that the, that the artists came up with uh, and we'd incorporate them into the, uh, the storyline. And the more the artists could understand where we were going with the story, the better. So if we proposed a creature, let's say a skin, skim wing or an elu, we needed to define its behavior for the story. And then the artist would take that and, and when, they, when they drew and painted their version of the creature, they'd show, for example, the elu, they'd show it in a kind of dolphin-like social behavior uh, as opposed to the skim wings, which, uh, which were the kind of big flying fish, which were meant to be quite fierce and, qu and quite fast. So, uh, you know, it was really closing the loop and that helped us with our cultural development as well as we're developing a new not be culture, you know, of the sea people, uh, you know, the reef people. And so trying to close that loop as much as possible really worked well for me too, being in the middle of that, being inspired by the images. And then I could say to the writers, well, let's spend a little more time in this area. In addition, in the writer's room, we also had somebody who was what we called our Pandorapedia person. Someone who was literally just taking notes so that we could make some of the concepts that didn't make it into the scripts part of our larger canon as we look to build the franchise, whether it's in Pandora, the world of Avatar, down in Orlando, or in, in gaming, or in publishing. So that, that was a very valuable, uh, fruitful uh, you know, time. Yeah, we were constantly spinning out ideas, and, and there's only so many that you could incorporate uh, into the script. But any idea that we deemed worthy and, and uh, worthy of being sort of a canonical part of the greater Pandora lore, who knows where that idea might show up downstream with novelizations or graphic novels or whatever. So we tried to keep track of it all as much as humanly possible. So the scripts, the scripts get completed, the actors read them, What's next? What's next? We, we jump into what we call virtual production, um, which is you know where we use performance capture, um, and we try to create performance capture around what is a very director-actor-centric process. To us, it's all about the performances, and uh, what could we get there? And Jim would go in the virtual world, and he'd go on scouts of locations that we would build virtual sets. We would have a troop of actors who are you know, stand-in actors, blocking for Jim so he would get a sense, just like a director would, and really try to create as much of a live action paradigm for a director, but then go into a very director, actor centric performance capture period of time. It kind of, it kind of follows a normal prep period on a, on a live action film where, where you're either location scouting 
And, and when you like your locations, you then do a more formal tech scout, figure out where you're really going to put your cameras and your lights and all that, or you're building sets or some combination. Uh, so our art department was tasked with building virtual spaces, external exterior spaces, in, interior spaces, whether it's part of the human world, uh, you know, at the base or the vehicles or out in the forest or at the reef. They would build these sets and then we'd get what we call our troop. And our troop were, were a bunch of uh, highly experienced uh, performance capture actors. And we'd bring them in and I'd say, okay, Kevin, you're going to be Jake and you're going to be Nateri or whatever. And then we'd, we'd sort of block it out and we'd get these kind of living storyboards, if you will. Um, it's a form of pre viz but I don't think of it as pre viz because it's just viz. You're just, you're just des- working and designing shots and, and sort of reconfiguring the sets as you go and reconfiguring the lighting and really getting it all teed up to, what, to when you bring the actors in. So you're ready, so you have sets and you're, you're ready to go. Um, fortunately, a number of our actors had worked with us on the first film, so they knew the, they knew the drill of performance capture. Uh, they were able to help with the, with the young kids who were coming in, our uh, you know, seven, seven-year-old through mid-teen uh, young actors that had never had experience most of them hadn't had experience acting for a film, let alone in performance capture. So the irony is they, they now just think that's how movies are made. Uh, a little bit of a cold shock to them when they, when they got on live action films after, after Avatar. But the period that John's referring to, the virtual production, was about a year and a half. A year and a half of capture with our principals. And that's a highly actor-centric process. As a director, I can, I can take out half of my brain that might have been dealing with normally, uh, you know, where do you put the dolly, where do you put the crane, where do you put the key light, all that sort of thing, keeping track of millions of extras and the sun is setting, and all that sort of thing. I can take that all away because I can just focus on my, my core characters for literally a year and a half. So the actors like it because they have a lot more of my attention and, and focus. I like it because that's just the problem that I'm dealing with. So I kind of transition from being a writer and imagining the characters and situation to working with the cast and then just it's essentially almost an extension of that creative process because now we're dealing with the characters and their emotions and their problems and all that and then eventually we move on we we let the actors go they can they can go work on other movies now we get into the virtual photography where I'm literally figuring out all my camera angles and the actual you know, lighting that'll be in the movie and all that sort of thing. So it sounds a bit schizophrenic, but it's actually kind of in a funny way, much more creative. Jim, let me add one other step in there, which is the camera edit, which is a very important right. step in our process. Our editors, we are always filming reference cameras of our actors. We're, so we're filming photographic close-ups of them. Our editors and Jim then go create edits, picking out the best performances for each sequence, almost coming up with a structure for it. Those become camera loads, and that's what Jim's talking about when he goes out and shoots virtual cameras. And the, one of the great things about this process is if an actor gives a great performance, with, with, that's a very emotional performance, we only have to capture it once. And we could use it when Jim does the virtual camera for the close-up, for a dolly shot, for a wide shot, when he creates all of that. But it's all after an editorial process where Jim and the editors pick the best of the best. Now, I think it's important to think about this as you wouldn't you wouldn't do this type of filmmaking if you didn't have to. But one of the things we wanted to do was create these really interesting, amazing characters that are kind of like us, but kind of different. And they have tails, and they have ears, and they have these giant, you know, golden eyes, and so on. And so there's something kind of very compelling about them as you as you're watching uh, that we wouldn't be able to do with makeup, with prosthetic makeup. At least it would be an uphill fight. It wouldn't look as good. Um, so you have to have a reason to do it. I don't think you'd do it if you were going to do a story about a talking frog or a talking moose. It has to be something that's that's meaningfully actable, you know, by by our by our actors. Um, and if you could just shoot it, just shoot it normally, why wouldn't you? You know, I, it's not like we're trying to replace photography. It's, it it exists in a kind of a narrow band that's almost specific to this idea of a of a fantasy kind of waking waking dream state. So we try to make it as, as real and as photographically 
real as, as possible. But we still know that there's a, a narrow band of utilization for this technique. Jim, when we got into the live action, you know, we, we went to, you know, some traditional live action techniques, but added our own spin to it, where we knew we had a lot of scenes with CG characters interacting with live action characters, and we had created something on the first movie that we called Simulcam, where we were simultaneously feeding to the eyepiece of the camera computer-generated images that weren't there physically on the set. But Jim could then compose visually to it. On this movie, Jim, though, we added the, the depth composite, and that made a big difference too, I think. Well, it's a really interesting suite of tools. I, I think Simulcam, I mean, there may be filmmakers that are attracted to doing the kind of virtual production that we're, they're doing, and, th and that's cool, and, and we'd support that and teach whatever we learn. But I think the greater application from, from what we've learned and developed on this project is the Simulcam, because there's, there's CG effects, there's VFX in almost every movie these days, and a lot of movies inhabit a space that's largely on the live action side, maybe 80, 90%, but still involves a lot of set extensions and replacement stuff and CG characters entering that that world space. Um, so we created this whole suite of tools around the live action camera, which happened to be a 3D camera, but it could be a 2D camera. That, that's kind of the least of the issue. But it had a, a real-time depth discrimination function built into it, and I, and I mean real-time. So CG characters could circle around live action characters and they were fully, they were fully integrated. It wasn't like a, a layers of alphas running through a compositor. It was literally based on essentially voxels. It literally was volumetric. So you could have a set extension that, that once it was aligned, continued on almost you know, with centimeter accuracy, and people could come and go out of that set extension, walk around each other, and even physically interact if we put puppeteers in the space in blue suits so they were held out in a conventional way. Uh, they could push back and interact and hand objects to each other and all that sort of thing. And I like to operate. I didn't operate the whole movie, but I operated probably about half of it. And I love just being handheld and being in the kind of this hybrid world that was part virtual and part live action. Or I could be, you know, on the wheels of a remote head or whatever. But uh, we, we worked with a lot of, you know, previous shots, but we also could just make stuff up on the set. It's pretty amazing. If I decided it looked better from over here, I'm seeing that whole virtual space moving and the characters within it and my live action characters and set pieces in the foreground. So it was incredibly creative, flexible, intuitive. Um, and I think since we had such good luck with it on the first film, we spent a number of the intervening years really developing that t technique to a, to a refined art form. On the first film, it was much more of a prototype and it was pretty glitchy, but we became dependent on it. Um, so we knew we had to clean it up and, and make it the best that it, that it could be. And I'd love to have the opportunity to demonstrate that to filmmakers that are, that are interested, that think that it might you know, speed up their process or, or make, their, make their films better. I mean, we're, we, we believe in a kind of open source approach on, on all this stuff because I'm a firm believer in the idea that a rising tide raises all ships together and the more people embrace all these techniques and improve upon them, it kind of feeds back to us and we'll just be better off next time we go into battle. So COVID hits, where are you? And does it <laughs> set you back so, significantly? So we don't- Are you talking about me personally right now? <laughs> I'm talking about <laughs> that, that production. So, we we well, always schedule- two blocks of live action filming. One, one in 2019 and one in March of 2020. Oh. <laughs> and, and if you saw, you just saw the movie, a lot of our live action filming revolved around a young 15 year old boy named Spider. And COVID hit right when we had completed half of his work. And he was growing like a sprout. <laughs> and. You know, for us, it was it was in paramount to, to get back and, and be up and filming, you know, as quickly as possible. But we also wanted to do it as safely as possible. I really think, you know, if you, you talk to our team and thanks to Jim, we got very much ahead of the curve on the pandemic. We were we were dealing with it in early February um, with with our team. And we had a great team down in New Zealand uh, led by Bridget York and a safety officer named Paul Anderson, 
Um, and we also, Jim and I put together a team of seven medical advisors to come advise us you know, on, on how to get back up and running and, and to do it safely. And we put together, I want to say, close to a 100-page safety document, uh, approached the uh, New Zealand government, who had been in a lockdown, about letting us come back in, letting us start up and working safely. And in, in June of that year, I think we were the first major production back filming. And thank goodness, because Jack did continue to grow. Yeah, well, we managed to shoot him out before he, he didn't intercut properly. But John, I can't recall, but I think we might have had a few cases peripherally, but we never lost a day of shooting no, we, to, we, the, to the pandemic. Nobody on our shooting crew while we were filming got COVID. And that, that is a testament to Bridget and Paul and the procedures that everybody put in place. Um, you know, yeah, we, we went to the mask and face shields and we went into, you know, craft service didn't look like craft service anymore. You know, everything was individually wrapped. We had people going around wiping door handles. We limited the number of people on the set. We limited the interaction with, you know, and everybody came in every day through a medical checkpoint. You know, nobody was- We were lucky that we, we were at Stone Street Studios and we'd basically taken it over. And we wound up with more stage space available than we really needed. So we were able to spread sets apart and we were able to use some stage space to create uh, a separate workspace for some of our technical people who were feeding into the live action shoot with the simulcam and things like that. But we kept them sequestered. So we broke it down into small teams as much as, as we possibly could. And also a lot of credit is due to the New Zealand government who were very effective in su suppressing and eradicating the virus as, as well. We took all our precautions on top of that, uh, but that certainly was a lucky factor in our favor. The biggest thing we had to combat was, you know, people's enthusiasm to come to work. I have a little cough, but I'm really okay. Yeah. We'd go, nope, go home. And that was part of the checkpoint where we asked those questions and sent people home, even if they were willing to come to work. We this had a testing protocol, but it was also about the thing. One, another thing was, that was in our favor is that, you know, our, Zealand, our New Zealand crew, they have a, an ethos in New Zealand of, of uh, kind of watching each other's backs and so they, they, they were pretty good about, you know, if you, if you look them in the eye and said, are you feeling a little unwell today? They, they'd say yes, they wouldn't try to play it off. And so the cooperation of the crew was really super critical. Um, and I think it took a little bit of, of John and I, you know, talking to everybody and talking them through it and say, you know, we understand your enthusiasm. We understand the fact that you feel a strong responsibility to be here, but your greater responsibility is to our, our group well-being. So factor that in and be honest, and they and they were they were they were great. And we continually had to ask them to practice what we are doing at work in their personal lives, because you know that's where the real vulnerability would, would come. And th these people made that commitment, and uh, very appreciative of that. This is the best three D I have ever seen in my life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. From the minute the logo goes up, you see the difference. Things are further out. Things are real. Tell us about raising the bar with the aesthetic, what needed to be done. And there's a philosophy here. It's about accentuating certain things dramatically. Right, it's almost about staying out of the way of the story and not getting in the way of the story, but enhancing as you go along. And, and, uh, you know, i had been working with 3D since 1999, starting off in some IMAX documentaries. Then, you know, we really cut our teeth on a feature with the first, with the first film. Um, and then we saw all the deficits, all the things we could do better. So in between, we had plenty of time to develop our tools. We worked with Sony, for example, who did what they call the Rialto. We didn't call it that at the time. We just called it the separable head. So they took the imager head and they created a leash that allowed it, uh, you know, a digital uh, leash that allowed it to be disconnected from the main electronics of the camera. Because we needed small light imager heads and small light lens sets so that we could put two of them together into a, an 11 axis motion control system, which is what our rig essentially is, and have it all be light enough for me to hand hold on my shoulder at the tender age of 65, 66. Mm -hmm. Uh, and do all the normal moves that I would love to do 
Um, and Sony were, were very helpful on that. We had our own in-house team under Jeff Burdick, who's our, our uh, uh, president, but also runs our group that we call Sector 5. Um, and Sector 5 is, is a technical group. So they, and we had a long experience working with Sony. So that got us the tool set. Then after that, the ethos was just author for 3D, check the 3D as you're doing the live action, go to the monitor, just make sure things are working, any kind of foreground wipes or water drips or whatever, make sure it's all working. Change your settings if you need to massage it into place. And another big tool in the quiver was the high frame rate, which is a bit controversial. We tried to apply it not as a format from end to end, like 70 millimeters format, right? Cinemascope's a format. We tried to, to think of it more as a part of an authoring tool set, um, kind of like you know, like music at the mix. You can have music or not have music. It's a, it's a, uh, an authoring choice, um, creative choice. And where we applied it was to smooth out strobing. Because some people say, I get a headache, it hurts my eyes. And, and that's all quantifiable. It's all understandable. When you have, you know, vertical objects with high contrast across that, that boundary and it moves laterally at a high rate, it kind of judders across the frame and it, it messes with that part of our brain that tries to decode parallax information. So without getting too technical, we, we kind of knew that and we planned for it. I would say, you know, so much of this film, any technical success we had was based on a lot of planning and a lot of learning from the previous film, which is, you know, kind of one of the advantages of setting down the road of a, of a franchise or a series of films is that you can make each one better than the last by improving your technique in between, especially if you're out, you know, kind of on the frontier, like we were on the first movie and dealing with a lot of prototype technology. What was prototype on movie one is, is mature tech on movie two and reliable. And I think you know, part of it is also the philosophy that we bring to 3D, which is we look at 3D as a window into a world, not a world coming out of a window. Yeah. And you know, and if we bring something out of the window, we're interrupting the suspension of disbelief. We've just worked so hard to earn from you. And and I think we utilize 3D, Jim. You know, really, it's more about the, the close-ups and the, and the indoor scenes. And when we get into fast-cutting action, it, it's maybe not as important in those quicker shots. Right. Uh, well, one of the things that's interesting to discuss, and I don't know if we're going to do Q&A, but I'd love to discuss this more if you guys are interested, is where 3D is in the marketplace right now. You know, one of the things that really worked as all, kind of luck in our, in our favor is that we were pretty vocal in the early days, myself and some other filmmakers uh, and some DPs, in dealing with the with uh, Texas Instruments and the and the various companies like Christie's and so on that were developing the the digital projectors, and we said and and I was on the board of Realty at the time. This is going back you know ten years now, but it was but the but the proposal to them was well, why not just baseline three D, just build it in, just build it into your architecture, and build in high frame rate as well. So we managed to convince them to do that. And so as a result now, out there, all the digital cinemas in the, in the world, even new ones that are being built right now, are all pretty much 3D capable and high frame rate capable. So um, it's fallen off in, in interest from the consumer. People are now, they were up around 85%, they're now down around 30%, although they might be higher for an Avatar movie because they do kind of associate different brands with different levels of, of 3D. But the point is the installed base is all out there. So if somebody comes along and does a beautiful 3D film, it's all still there. We can, we can reap that benefit. We don't have to fight the uphill battle that we fought back in, you know, 2004, 2005, 2006 to get those projectors out there so that this discussion could even be had. And while it's true that 3D is, has lost its luster in attracting people to the student to the to the theaters, um, it hasn't gone away by a long stretch. And a lot of the big tentpole movies are still offered in 3D. I look at it more now like it's a consumer choice. You don't have to see the movie in 3D. You can see it in 2D. It's still a beautiful movie. You know, I'm talking about any movie now, but but our movie, I would say, still well acted. It's still got amazing designs. All the things 
I'd say 95% of the things you like about the movie are still there. If you want an enhanced experience, you can seek it out in 3D. I also think it's important to point out that at the time, and I don't quote me on these figures exactly, but we had somewhere around 6,000 theaters globally in 2009 when we first came out with the first Avatar. And we're now at somewhere around 120,000 3D capable theaters worldwide. Now granted, half of those are in China, but it's still 60,000 versus versus 6,000. So an order of magnitude. So uh, it's, it's much more ubiquitous and much less in demand. But to me that nets out into it's still a big a big and, and vital part of our industry. Especially now we're trying to get people to go back to the theaters and 3D never caught on in the home, on TV. Um, so it's it's one of our big differentiators now in getting people into, into theaters because sound and picture are actually pretty good in the home these days. My last question is, uh, this movie survived a merger a revolving suite of studio executives. It survived COVID, and it is you're going to have a fantastic weekend. And it's sur- and it survived uh, theater closures, and we we got cinemas open. At any point in time, particularly during COVID, were you know when theaters were closed, were you were you concerned? I mean, there were people that were fearful, very fearful. There was the notion that we were going to live in our houses for the rest of our lives watching streaming. <laughs> yeah. But what what gave you faith? Did you say there is a light at the end of that tunnel and we are that light? We might have two different answers on this one. Yeah, you go ahead, John, because you were always the optimist. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I, I felt that you know we would overcome it, and I felt that that cinema would be the type of thing that people would always want to return to. I did I did a presentation recently where I quoted the uh, New York Times, and I'm paraphrasing here, and the New York Times wrote that entertainment can be had at a cut rate at home, and the motion picture business as we know it is going to die. And that was written in March of 1983. (laughs) (laughs) And so I always believed that we would overcome this, and, 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 and now I felt it was our responsibility as filmmakers to create something that reminds people of just how special the cinema going experience can be. And Jim, at our our premiere in London, he talked about that. He talked about that this premiere is not a celebration just of Avatar, but it's a celebration of cinema, an art form that that has been part of our lives forever, and we want to maintain a part of people's lives forever in the future. It was a beautiful evening because we had one of the best cinemas in the world, that had been fully restored by, by uh, you know, was Adam Aaron's Pride and Joy, you know, head of AMC, the Odeon Leicester Square, and it was a packed house, 800 people in black tie. And I thought, I looked out at that audience and I thought, okay, people, people want this. We collectively as a society want this. We want this type of experience just like we want live concerts and live sporting events. And so it's not going to go away. But there was a there was the kind of dark night of the soul, I think, right when the pandemic first hit, and theaters were just empty. There were tumbleweeds blowing in the aisles, and people were going out of business left and right. And I thought this could be it. You know, we survived the advent of television. People were pronouncing movies dead long before 1983. They were pronouncing it dead in 1963. You know, but then we survived television. We survived VHS, and Beta. And, and cable and VOD and streaming right up until the pandemic. But the second we couldn't gather, that was the one critical thing. We couldn't gather. And that looked like the end to me. I mean, I even talked to some of, you know, by Zoom, some of my director pals and said, that's it, guys, we're done. You know, I mean, we're storytellers. We'll always get a gig. We'll, you know, we'll work in streaming, but we might be done with theatrical. And, you know, of course, we were building this big lumbering dinosaur of a movie that was meant to be seen in theaters. And, um, you know, so that was a real crisis of faith for me. But then, you know, fortunately, we we pushed out as a result of the pandemic, and that bought us an extra year. I think if we'd been trying to release a year ago, we'd be in a very different situation than we are right now. But fortunately, we've had big theatrical successes in the meantime. Top Gun and Wakanda Forever and a number of other 
films. And, and I think we've proven to our own satisfaction as a society that we want and demand this enough uh, that the business is still there. We've also seen, you know, streaming kind of, that bubble's expanding close to the popping point because if everybody jumping into the streaming game is just spending, throwing stupid money at creating, you know, massive amounts of content to try to buy subs, that's an unsustainable kind of Ponzi scheme. And so that's going to contract. Movies are continuing to expand. And I think it's all going to find a balance point as, as you know, two different parts of an ecosystem the way the way it should be and the way, the way it used to be. Avatar The Way of Water is not done. You guys are not done, and neither is cinema. So yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, John Landau. Thank you all for coming tonight and seeing the movie on the big screen. We appreciate that. Tell your Thank friends you. Thursday, tomorrow, 3 p.m. preview start. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Avatar will be in theaters starting December 16th. Thanks so much for checking this out. If you like it, don't forget to subscribe. Give it a thumbs up if you like it. It really helps me out. And I hope to see you next time. We have a lot more of these coming up in the future. And I'll see you in line at the concession stand. Thank you.